in your Bibles the Old Testament book of Daniel, and we're coming nearer to the conclusion of our study through this book. Uh, we'll finish up next Sunday in chapters 11 and 12, but today we're in Daniel chapter 10. Daniel chapter 10, and I want to preach this morning on this subject, Help is on the Way. Help is on the Way. We have learned a lot in our study of Daniel. We've learned that Daniel was a man of prayer. We've learned that God spoke to Daniel and God gave Daniel visions. Today, from Daniel chapter 10, this idea, help is on the way. When Daniel prayed, God sent the answer. The answer was delayed, but then God delivered the answer in his perfect timing. Let's just read Daniel chapter 10. We'll read verse 1, and uh, we'll study the entire chapter this morning. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a word was revealed to Daniel, who was named Belteshazzar. And the word was true, and it was a great conflict. And he understood the word and had understanding of the vision. Remember this morning, the power is in the perfect word of God. Would you join me in prayer as we prepare to study His Word? God, I want to thank you so much this morning for the truth of Scripture. I want to thank you for the promise in your Word that you hear us when we pray and that you answer. I want to thank you that greater is He that is in us than He that is in the world. And that you've given us the victory, that you've given us the ability to overcome the enemy. Speak today through your Word. Holy Spirit of God, you do a great work In Jesus' name, amen. Help is on the way. The story is told of a mother who wanted to expand her young son's musical interests. So she took him to a piano concert that was featuring a famous pianist named Paderewski. After being seated, she saw a friend on the other side of the theater. And so she decided she wanted to go speak to her friend before the concert began. She looked at her young son and she said, these are our seats. You stay right here. Don't move. I'm going to talk to my friend. As you can imagine, her young son sat there for a moment and got a little fidgety and couldn't quite be still. And all of a sudden, he decided he wanted to get up and he wanted to explore the music hall. He got up and walked around a little bit until he came to a spot that he saw was covered up with giant curtains. He walked back behind the curtain and there... Behind the curtain was this piano. It had a spotlight on it, and the piano, there's nobody there, and it was dark everywhere else, so he just went and sat down. Well, in in the intervening moments, the lights began to flash, letting everyone know the, the show was about to begin. And the mom rushed back to her seat after speaking to her friend and looked everywhere, and she could not find her son. She thought, she hoped, maybe he just went to the restroom, he'll be right back. And then all of a sudden, the curtain comes up, And there's her little son sitting at the bench of the piano. And right when the curtain comes up, he plays the only song he knows. Twinkle, twinkle, little star. Everybody in the theater, everybody in the the conference center is shocked. And then all of a sudden, quickly, from the wings, walks in this wonderful pianist, Paderewski. He comes back right behind the boy and he says, listen to this now. He says to the boy, whispers in his ear, keep playing. Don't stop. You're doing just fine. And here he is, twinkle, twinkle, little star. And all of a sudden, this grand pianist reaches his left hand behind the boy on the left side of the piano and begins to add these beautiful bass notes And then he reaches his right hand behind the boy and he begins to add these beautiful scales in the treble cleft. And it turned out to be the most beautiful rendition of Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star you've ever heard in your entire life. Everybody clapped and everybody cheered and everyone stood up and there was this little boy. The pianist set him right in front and told him to give a bow to the whole crowd. It was the best performance of his entire life. And I want you to think about what's happening in the book of Daniel. And I want you to think about what God's doing in Daniel's life. And I want you to think about how God works in our lives as well. In reality, sometimes the very best that we can do is Mary had a little lamb or twinkle, twinkle, little star. But when we allow God to use us for his glory, he begins to kind of come behind us and build in the beautiful music build in the wonderful things that he wants to accomplish and he gets the glory and he gets the honor and he gets the praise. But the beauty of it is, 
we get to be a part of it. Isn't it amazing how God works in our lives? He is so good and faithful. And since, since Daniel was about 15 years old, maybe younger, Daniel's been a part of God's great symphony. Daniel's been a part of, of God's great plan. It doesn't make sense to Daniel right there in the moment as he's exiled. He's taken away from Jerusalem. He's stolen by vicious and murderous kings. He's taken to Babylon. He's raised up at Babylon University to reject the one true living God. Yet he stays true to his faith and to what he knows to be true of Jehovah God. And God has been working and God has been moving. And now Daniel chapter 10, the Bible tells us this occurs in the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia. Now that's, that's around 536 BC. Daniel is now in his mid-80s. He's probably 84, 85 years old. He has spent the vast majority of his life in a strange and foreign pagan land, surrounded by people worshiping false idols and false gods. And he survived in kingdom and kingdom after kingdom and administration after administration. And here the Bible tells us, beginning in verse 10, that God gives Daniel this vision after Daniel had been fasting and mourning and praying for three weeks. You see that in verse 2. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning for three weeks. Daniel was heartbroken. He was fasting. He was praying. Why? I believe there are two reasons. At this point in history, many had returned to Jerusalem after being destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon. Many had returned Cyrus, the king of Persia, had allowed them to go back and to rebuild the city of Jerusalem. But it had been a couple of years now, and Daniel was heartbroken because in just a couple of years, you know what they'd done? The only thing they'd done in a couple of years is they'd rebuilt the foundation of the temple. They were not getting the job done, and they were falling back into the old ways of idolatry, sin, wickedness, and rebellion. And another reason Daniel was heartbroken is he's getting all these crazy visions and dreams from God. And he wants to know exactly what they mean. So he's spending time in prayer asking God, would you reveal to me what these visions mean so that I can know the truth and I can know what you want me to know. Now remember, Daniel received four visions from God. Daniel chapter 7 is the first. Daniel chapter 8 is the second. Daniel chapter 9 is the third. And the fourth and final vision is Daniel chapters 11 and 12. Those are four visions great visions of the future. Some of those things have occurred already in our past, but some are yet to occur in our future. All of them were future to Daniel. So Daniel chapter 10 tells us how Daniel prepares to receive this final vision from God, that Daniel's praying and asking God for wisdom, for discernment, and for understanding of the vision. And I want us to learn three major things Three major points this morning about how God answers our prayers. First of all, God opens our eyes. God opens our eyes. We see this in the first nine verses. The news from Jerusalem was disturbing. The small remnant of the Jews that had returned had stalled in their work. These were the faithful remnant that wanted to go back and rebuild Daniel's homeland And everything was not going according to plan. Some renegade Jews were opposing the rebuilding efforts. The fourth chapter of Ezra records how the enemies of Judah did everything they could to to stop, to discourage the builders. And finally, an edict was sent out. It was so chaotic, the edict was sent out that just said, stop all the reconstruction work. And when that got back to Daniel via Camel Express, Daniel was brokenhearted. Daniel was greatly disturbed. Look at what he says in verses 2 and 3. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning and fasting for three weeks. I ate no delicacies. In the Hebrew, that means Krispy Kreme. I ate no delicacies, no meat or wine, no outback steakhouse, nor did I anoint myself at all for a full three weeks. In other words, Daniel was in mourning for three solid weeks. For 21 days, he's fasting, he's praying. Uh, The Bible says he ate no delicacies. Right? He's pushing food away. The Bible says he didn't anoint himself. So, so much like if we're going out on the town, maybe you're going to wear perfume, maybe you're going to wear cologne. In those days, they didn't have running water and showers, so it was very important. So you can imagine the scene and the situation. Daniel is in a very dark, very disturbed and discouraged place. When Daniel was burdened, I want you to notice. 
When Daniel was burdened, when he was heartbroken, where did he go? He didn't go to his counselor. He didn't go to his friends. Where did he go? Daniel began to pray. Daniel went to the Lord. And what happened when Daniel prayed? God opened his eyes. God opened his eyes. So there's Daniel. The Bible tells us in verse 3, uh, verse 4, Daniel is standing on the banks of the Tigris River. Maybe, maybe when you're discouraged or down or depressed, you know, one of the things that they say you need to do is change your scenery. So maybe Daniel got out of his, got out of his house, got out of his room, and he's walking along the Tigris River one day, and maybe he's just hanging out, maybe he's skipping rocks, maybe he's looking up at heaven saying, God, I don't understand. They're back in Jerusalem. Things aren't happening. I'm receiving these visions. I don't know what you're doing, God. I'm so confused. And so maybe you skip and rocks one day, and then in that very moment, Daniel receives a remarkable vision. Look what the Bible says here in verse 5 through verse 9. Verses 5 through 9. Listen to this vision that Daniel sees. I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, a man clothed in linen with a belt of fine gold from Euphaz around his waist. His body was like beryl, his face like the appearance of lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze, and the sound of his words like the sound of a multitude. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision, for the men who were with me did not see the vision, but a great trembling fell upon them, and they fled to hide themselves. So I was left alone and saw this great vision, and no strength was left in me. My radiant appearance was fearfully changed, and I retained no strength. Then I heard the sound of his words. And as I heard the sound of his words, I fell on my face in a deep sleep with my face to the ground. Can you imagine this awesome, terrible scene that unfolds before Daniel's eyes? He's, by the end of it, he's wore out, man. He completely faints. He's done. He encounters a great An awesome vision. Now, what did he see? What did Daniel see? The Bible tells us here he looks like a man, but he's clearly more than a man. Now, I want you to know most students of Scripture believe that this is an angel. And the reason they believe it's an angel is because in verse 10, it says, And behold, a hand touched me and set me trembling. And in verse 10, there's an angel speaking to Daniel. But... That's probably the more popular opinion, but I believe the description in Daniel chapter 10, verses 5 through 9, parallels Daniel, or Revelation chapter 1, verses 12 through 16. And I want you to listen to what the Bible says. It'll be on your screens. In Revelation chapter 1, verses 12 to 16, as it describes Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Listen to Revelation chapter 1, beginning in verse 12. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on the turning I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the lampstands, here it is, was one like the Son of Man. Now this is Jesus, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white like wool, like snow. His eyes were a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in the furnace. His voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand, he held the seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. And his face was like the sun, shining in full strength. I want you to know, while most scholars believe this is an angel, they can be wrong all they want. I believe it's Jesus Christ, and here is why I believe it. Who's being described? Listen to the description. There are many connections between Daniel chapter 10 and Revelation chapter 1. Both are described as wearing white robes, that is priestly garb. Both have a gold belt, that is kingly apparel. Both have blazing eyes, both have bronze skin, both have roaring voices. All of these are supernatural traits. In Revelation, the one described holds seven stars in his hand and his face blazes like the sun. Perhaps that explains why the appearance of a man in Daniel made the prophet faint as if he were dead. The one who comes as the spokesman for God in answer to Daniel's prayer is none other than the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, the one who made the heavens and the earth, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's who showed up. Now think about it. Daniel's praying. Daniel's asking God, Lord, what's going on in Jerusalem? What about these visions and these dreams? 
For three weeks, he's asking for understanding. And God answers his prayer by giving him a vision of Jesus. Wow, what an answer. Don't you love the fact that when God begins to speak to his people, he doesn't just give us the answer we're seeking, he gives us the answer we need. Daniel wants to know about all these specific things, and God says to him, here's one main thing you need to know. And so you might not get all the specific answers to all the specific questions that you have, but when God reminds you of who Jesus is, that answer is enough. And that's what he does. He gives him a vision of Jesus. It's kind of like when you're at the theater. Maybe you're watching a play and the curtain is closed. So we, we know that there are things happening behind the curtain, but we can't see what's going on. They're getting the stage right. The actors are getting in place. And then all of a sudden, maybe you've been at a play before where the curtain is pulled back before it's supposed to be. And we see a little bit of what's happening behind the scenes. That's what's happening here in Daniel chapter 10. God peels back the curtain into the spiritual realm and gives Daniel a view of what's happening behind the scenes. God is opening his eyes. In one of Daniel's darkest moments, God pulls back the curtain. And what does he show Daniel? The thing he needs the most, he shows Daniel a glimpse of the Lord Jesus Christ. And what happens? Verse 9. What happened? Then I heard the sound of his words. And as I heard the sound of his words, I fell on my face in a deep sleep with my face to the ground. It knocked him out. He couldn't handle it. God opens our eyes. Secondly, God fights our battles. God fights our battles. God heard Daniel from the moment he started to pray. Listen to this now. But the answer answer was intercepted somewhere between heaven and earth. While Daniel is still shaking in his sandals from the vision he just received. Here An angel taps him on the shoulder and says, verse 12, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and humbled yourself before God, your words have been heard, and I have come because of your words. Verse 13, The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days, but Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I was left there with the kings of Persia. Now, I want to be clear. I believe the vision in verses 5 to 9 are a vision of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then I believe in verse 10 there is an angel, most likely the angel Gabriel, that taps Daniel on the shoulder to wake him up out of this deep sleep. You know, he cracks the smelling salts under his nose so he can wake up after fainting in the presence of the Lord. And there's a reason that I believe that this is an angel. Because the Bible tells us here that this angel was sent to help Michael overcome an enemy, a demon, who's described here as the prince of the kingdom of Persia. And so here, this is a fascinating account. Here, Daniel is praying on earth. God hears Daniel's prayer immediately. God dispatches an angel with the answer to Daniel's prayer. But between heaven and earth, this angel is attacked and accosted by an enemy, fallen angel, a demon. And after three weeks of warfare, God sends another angel, Michael, to help this angel bring the answer to Daniel. And you say, man, what in the world are you thinking? This is the most bizarre thing that I have ever heard in my life. Are you reading some kind of science fiction? Are you crazy? Listen to me, church. I want you to understand that there is a realm that we do not see. That there is a battle going on right now that our physical eyes cannot see. But if God would allow us to peel back the curtain and we could see into the spiritual realm right now, at this very moment, there are angels and demons battling. There is a spiritual warfare that you and I are called to engage in each and every day. And this account in Daniel chapter 10 reveals one of the most powerful 
descriptive moments of what happens in spiritual warfare. This is not a fictional story. Listen to me, just like God is real and angels are real, Satan is real and his demons are real. And the Bible tells us that a third of the angels of heaven followed after Satan and now they do his bidding. They are demons in the army of hell. But the Bible tells us in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 7, there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. The dragon and his angels fought back. So when the Bible says the prince of the kingdom of Persia, it's not talking about a man. It's not talking about a real literal prince who sat on a throne in Persia. It's talking about a demon, a high-ranking demon that was assigned over that kingdom of Persia. I want you to understand this more. Evil is not abstract. Evil is not some force that's lurking in the shadows that'll trip you up or you'll run into it from time to time. Evil, if you'll notice in the Bible, evil always originates in a personality. It either comes from within us, our fleshly desires. It either comes within us, our temptations. Or it comes from the enemy. It comes from Satan and his emissaries. And I want you to know what the Bible tells us here as well. The enemy is organized. He has troops all over. You see, the Bible doesn't say he was just attacked by a demon or a fallen angel. The Bible says he was attacked by the prince of the kingdom of Persia, meaning that there is a hierarchy, there are rankings, and there's an organized organized army that battles against the armies of God. And she said, wait a second now, Pastor, I don't don't understand. Isn't Satan a defeated foe? And if Satan is a defeated foe, why do we still battle? Why do we still have spiritual warfare? Why are we still struggling with these things? The answer is, absolutely yes, Satan is a defeated foe. His days are up, they are numbered, and one day he will be finally, totally, and completely annihilated. But the Bible does tell us, in this world we will face spiritual struggles. Until one day, When God puts an end to Satan and all evil. Daniel's given a glimpse into the future. It was 1944. Many of you know that date. World War II. Sub-Lieutenant Hiro Onoda of the Imperial Japanese Army was ordered to stay on Lubang Island in the Philippines. And he he was told to hold this island for the emperor. Well, it wasn't long after the following year... The Allies bombed Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and the Japanese surrendered. Shortly after, the war ended there. But but unfortunately, Hiro Onoda did not know the war was over. In fact, he kept on fighting the next year, and the next year, and the next year, and the year after that. In fact, he was still fighting 29 years after the end of World War II. He was totally unaware that the war had finished long ago. Even when the police searched through the jungle with megaphones asking him, begging him to stop shooting the citizens on the island there, he would not listen to them. He refused to give up. It wasn't until 1974 when they brought out his commanding officer and ordered him to surrender that he finally stopped fighting. And I want you to understand, church, do you know that the battle has already been won? I want you to understand that the cross of Calvary, Jesus Christ won the war. Now Satan and his enemies, between now and then, they have been fighting with all they can. They've been doing everything they can to discourage you. They've been doing everything they can to win the battle. But the war is over. The decision is already made. Jesus Christ wins. He fights our battles and he gives us the victory through his name, his blood, and his cross. Amen. God fights our battles. Yes, we will still struggle in this life, but if you know the Lord Jesus Christ, you are on the winning side, and one day you will be at His side as evil is done away with, and Christ reigns as King of kings and Lord of lords. Number three, God answers our prayers. God opens our eyes. God fights our battles. 
God answers our prayers. We see this in verse 10 and 11 as well as in verse 15 through 21. You know what the last three chapters of Daniel are? This is interesting now. The last three chapters, chapter 10, 11, and 12, record the answer to Daniel's prayer. Now we're going to get into the specifics of the answer next week, this final vision. But these last three chapters are in the Bible because Daniel prayed. You hear me? They're in the Word of God because Daniel was a man of prayer and God sent an answer and this is the answer that God sent. You remember Daniel was praying for three weeks. He was mourning. He was fasting. He focused on the Lord. He fought a spiritual battle. It is not hard to discover as you read the book of Daniel that Daniel was a prayer warrior. He was a man committed and devoted to prayer. And as you read the Bible, you'll notice something significant. I'm about to blow you away. You ready for this? God answers prayers. God answers prayers. I know that it's not anything you've never heard before and it's not profound, but listen to me, it is profound. It is significant. And if we genuinely believe that, we would pray like God answers prayers. Notice what the Bible says. He answers our prayers. Verse 10, Behold, a hand touched me and sent me trembling on my hands and knees. And listen to what he says. O Daniel, man greatly loved, Understand the words that I speak to you and stand upright, for now I have been sent to you. And when he spoke to me, I stood up trembling. Daniel, I have been sent to you. This is in response to your prayer. In fact, in verse 19, as he's revealing this answer, he says, Peace with you, peace be with you, be strong, be courageous. Don't miss this phrase in verse 21. I'll tell you what's inscribed in the book of truth. In, in other words, Daniel, I'm going to give you the answer. The answer comes in chapter 11 and 12. But notice this. There's none who contends by my side except these, Michael, your prince. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to give you the answer. But it's clear, the angel indicates to Daniel, I'm here today because you prayed. When Daniel began to pray, demonic forces rose up against the angelic forces and warfare broke out. Do you know what that means? It means that when you pray, you unleash the very power of heaven on behalf of God and what you're praying for. That means that when you pray, God sends angels in response to your prayers. Hebrew chapter 1 and verse 14. Angels are ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation. If you know Jesus, that's you and that's me. God sends angels to answer our prayers. Now, here's an interesting question. What if it had been like this? What What if Daniel had given up on the 14th day? He prayed for three weeks. What if he'd given up on the 14th or maybe the 15th or 16th? What if he was tired? He was done. He said, God, my prayers are hitting the ceiling. I'm not getting through. I'm not getting the answer. I'm done. What would have happened? You know, we don't really know because the Bible doesn't say, but the implication is this. If he'd have given up, he'd have never received the answer. This is why Jesus tells us in the New Testament that we ought to pray. Here it is. Pray and never give up. Pray and never give up. Pray and never give up. Not because God is hard of hearing. Not because God needs to be pestered into answering. Not because God doesn't want to answer us. Jesus taught that we should always pray and not give up. Because when we pray, our prayers carry weight. They touch the very throne room of heaven. Every time you and I pray, we are growing more and more powerful. We receive more and more power. We're empowered by the Holy Spirit of God from the throne of God. And when we pray, God fights our battles for us. I want you to understand. You say, i got to do something. Listen to me. Prayer is not passive. It's not just praying and then sitting around and, and, and hoping that God does something. We pray in earnest expectation, and a praying believer unlocks the power of heaven. That's what's happening in Daniel. That's what's happening. Daniel was a man of prayer, fasting, praying for three weeks. Man, we, boy, we pray three minutes, and we think we've done a lot. And, and I, don't think, I don't think the Bible means to, it, to, to imply that Daniel prayed a little bit every day for three weeks. If you'll notice, remember Daniel received one of his first visions, and he'd been praying from the morning hours of prayer 
A Jew prays three times a day. He'd been praying all the way from the morning hours of prayer all the way into the afternoon hours of prayer. He'd been praying all day long. Daniel's focus during that time was intense prayer. He was on his face before God. There's a story in an old church. The organ broke down on a Sunday morning. They didn't know what to do years ago. And so actually one of the members of the congregation happened to be an organ repairman. And he immediately went to work. He was back there working while the pastor was preaching. And he fixed the organ about halfway through the sermon. And then he quietly passed the note to the organist right after he fixed it. And this is what it said. After prayer, the power will be on. After prayer, the power will be on. I think it would do us well to remember as the church of the living God, as believers in Jesus Christ, as families seeking to serve the Lord, after prayer, power will be on. God answers prayer. God has a word for each and every one of us. Many of you have heard of a man named George Mueller. If you've never read a biography of George Mueller, you need to put it on your list. You need to buy the book for Christmas. You need to make sure to read it as soon as possible. He was known for powerful prayer. In the course of his ministry in which he took care of orphans in England, he never asked for financial assistance from any man. He only prayed about it. And God answered time and time again, all the way down, specifically all the way down to the very penny. George Mueller's prayers were remarkable. He kept a prayer journal. Once on his way to speak in Quebec, uh, on the deck of the ship that was supposed to carry him to the destination, there was a captain, and he knew Mueller needed to be in Quebec by Saturday afternoon. And the captain, the captain tells this story. He said, it's impossible. Do you know how dense this fog is? We will never make it. Mueller replied to the captain, no, my eye is not on the density of the fog, but on the living God who controls every circumstance of life. I've never, I've never broken an engagement in 57 years. Let us go down to the chart room and pray. The captain said he knelt down and prayed one of the most simple prayers he'd ever heard. The captain said when he finished, I was going to pray, but, but Mueller said, there's no need for you to pray. As you do not believe, he will not answer you, but as I believe, there's no need for you, whatever, to pray about it. The captain says, I looked at him, and George Mueller said, Captain... I've known my Lord for 57 years, and there's never been a single day where I have failed to gain an audience with the king. Get up, open the door, and you will find the fog is gone. The captain got up, and he says, the fog indeed was gone. And on that Saturday afternoon in Quebec, George Mueller kept his promised engagement. God answers prayers. God answers prayers. Do we offer prayer? Listen to what happened. Daniel prays. And Daniel perseveres in prayer. Daniel continues to pray day after day after day. Day 10, day 15, day 20, day 21. God sent the answer the moment that he prayed. The answer was on the way. Help is on the way. And we learn here, God opens our eyes, God fights our battles, God answers our prayers. What if you had today everything you prayed for yesterday? What if those who you prayed for yesterday came to know Christ today? I don't understand it. I can't explain it, how the God who's in control of everything chooses to respond to the prayers of his people. I can't explain it, but I know he does. God answers prayers.